Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight and sacrificing a lovely evening to talk about food. It's something I'm really passionate about, and I'm so excited to see Campbell River is super passionate about it as well. This is about the size of crowd we also had in Comox. So um, before I begin, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a local farmer. My husband and I own um, Amara Farm. We're a certified organic vegetable and blueberry farm in the Comox family. Valley. So we're just off of the highway, the old highway, when you go towards uh, Courtney. We've been here uh, in the valley for six years. Prior to that, I was the food security coordinator for Richmond. And my job was basically to try and encourage people to think exactly about this topic, what it is they're putting in their mouths. And it, was there a more thoughtful way of getting food to them. Uh, if any of you recall 2008, there was uh, major forest fires in Australia, in Russia, and people began hoarding food. I don't know if it happened up here in Campbell River, but the store shelves in the Lower Mainland were clear of grains especially, and suddenly people became aware that we really don't have much food food on store shelves, about two to three days worth of that. And people became more and more interested in this whole idea of food security. If that's a, t a term that you haven't heard before, I'll talk to it quite a lot. Um, it's one that I think everyone should consider and hopefully tonight it might spur you into doing something or choosing differently about where your food comes from, possibly growing some of your own food, but um, overall I hope you see food as something is not just calories that you're putting in your body, but absolutely that it's nourishment. So uh, I'm just going to start out by framing a little bit about the global food system coming down to Vancouver Island, Comox Valley, and then just a few personal stories to outline maybe what some of some issues that I see and about topics you want to talk about. So some of you may have heard globally there are about 400 million undernourished people in the world people who aren't getting enough calories. At the same time, we now have two billion people on the planet who are obese, who are getting too many calories. It's the first time that number has really tipped the scales. So if you can imagine 400 million undernourished, two billion overnourished. When we talk about can we actually feed the world, here is where some of the issues sit. Where is food grown? Where is it going and who is getting the most access to it? I would probably posit that it's North Americans have the biggest access to food, to calories. Uh, on Vancouver Island, we are an island um, to, in, our, in ourselves and I think island people often think slightly differently because we know all of our food needs to take a major trip to get here. And if those transportation corridors are cut off, we are hooped. Has anyone ever been through a time where the ferries or the trucks didn't make it to your superstore or your shelves? And suddenly you notice, wow, this just-in-time food system that we have, it can work very efficiently, but when there is a breakdown, we really run into some troubles. Vancouver Island used to produce 80 to 90 percent of the food that was consumed was grown here on the island. We had a fantastic system of dairy farms, of berry farms, vegetables, very diverse system. We are now down to 5 percent. Only 5 percent of what we consume is grown here on the island. And I would say a majority of that will probably be from the dairy sector, because our dairy is still quite strong. We have lost many of the vegetable growers, the berry growers, um, you know, 
all the other sort of systems. We had a lot of grain production on the island. That has almost completely gone. <coughs> so, you know, some of the things that we're trying to do to address this situation is educate, you know, a new generation of people, of young people especially, on the skills it takes to grow food. You know, if any of you have grown a garden, it's not just as easy as throwing some seed down and then coming back a few months later and harvesting and, and bountiful. So uh, school gardens are very important and, and burgeoning. I know Campbell River has quite a great network of gardens and schools uh, combining. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story of uh, one garden in the Comox Valley. So my daughter is at a high school and that high school didn't have a garden. And so myself with my Farmers Institute hat, I'm the president of the Mid-Island Farmers Institute. You know, one of our mandates is education in food systems, especially horticulture, food production. So we received a, a grant from Island Health to start a garden at the high school and to encourage youth, teachers, the whole community to come together and use that garden as a teaching site, as an outdoor classroom. And you know, for the most part, all the youth love it. You wouldn't think that teenagers would really enjoy going out and getting dirty, but they really do. Not many of them have the opportunities to get their hands dirty anymore. So we have this beautiful garden. It was growing all year last year. Much of the produce in the summertime was donated to different food programs in the Comox Valley, especially the food bank. Come September, you know, school came back into, into um, you know, school was opened and um, the cafeteria opened up. And we thought, wow, many of the students who work in the cafeteria are actually in the garden as well. Similar program. Wouldn't it be amazing for them to take some of the produce that they grew themselves and to serve it to their classmates? So, you know, they harvested and they had quite an amazing harvest, over 20 pounds of salad greens. They approached the chef, the head teacher at the cafeteria, and he refused to take it. So the lettuce was not from an approved source. So from a food safety point of view, he was scared of the liability of that lettuce not coming off of a Cisco truck, which is where all of his food is basically coming from. So could have been a very sad story. Luckily, my other daughter is in an elementary school which has a farm to school salad bar program. And we have been able to get local food into that salad bar program. It started five years ago, 30 students receiving salad every week. And just last week, we served 220. The numbers have increased every year, which is so fantastic. And that program was then able to receive the salad that the high school refused. So at least some young people got to eat salad and they knew where it came from. Um, so in the end, a happy ending. But I thought, you know, this story kind of highlighted a few of the key issues that we still have to work on um, if we want a more robust and resilient food system. So I'm going to open that up to you now and let's discuss, you know, things that are important to you, what you have questions about, and we'll see where it goes. Thank you, Azina. So I'm your moderator for the evening. Uh, my name is Peter. And uh, so if you have something you want to say or a question you wish to ask, uh, just let me know and I'm going to put, sort of put you all in order. So who's to be our first one for this evening? Who kicks off? There we are. Uh, concerning GMO, mm. is there any progress being made to make it, the knowledge available to us? The knowledge of what what or is genetically in, uh, okay. So I'm I'm going to answer that question, but maybe I'll back up a bit. Is everyone aware what GMO means? Genetically modified organism. So these are specific 
plants, animals that have been modified in a lab. So not through hybridization, which is something that farmers have been doing for thousands of years. This is where genes from two different species are combined. Bacteria generally are in, bacteria genes are inserted into plant genes. Um, there's been all kinds of combinations. Now, the government of Canada has seen fit to not label genetically modified crops. We have six major crops in Canada that are genetically modified. So for those of you who haven't heard, that would be canola, <coughs> corn, soybean, sugar beet, and now salmon. Um, there's an East Coast salmon, and I'm missing one, and it'll come to me. So how are you eating canola and you know these, these types of crops? These crops are gene generally um, grown for what we call the industrial food system, where they're either fed to animals and then you eat the meat, or they're converted to oils, soybean oil, canola oil, corn oil, or they're converted to sugars, and primarily the sugar beet and the corn, which makes itself into all kinds of high fructose corn syrup, blah, 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 which you would never find naturally occurring. So it's basically the products that are in the middle of the supermarket aisles, right? Not generally on the, so I didn't mention any vegetables. There's no GMO fruits that are grown in Canada. There is a GMO, Hawaiian papaya is genetically modified, so that is one. But in general, the outer edge of the supermarket is pretty safe. It's the inside that you have to worry about. Thank you. My next uh, is here. Yeah. Oops. Please. Um, Arzina, is it true then <coughs> that the wheat that we get in our bread nowadays is no, nothing like what it was 20 years ago? And uh, I have friends who, you know, don't eat wheat, don't eat bread, don't eat potatoes, yeah. don't eat storage. <clears throat> Excuse me, don't eat rice or pasta under the belief that, that things are so different nowadays. We just don't know what yeah. we're getting. So great question about wheat and what wheat is now versus what it was maybe in the 1950s, 1960s. So wheat was not one of the crops that I listed as being genetically modified, but it certainly has been modified. And one of the ways it's been modified is that um, the, the plants are now shorter, but the grain heads are much fatter and plumper. So that's been accomplished through modern breeding. Right. They, instead of growing tall stalks, that energy is now, you know, plants were chosen so that they had big fat seeds. What that means is primarily the seeds have a lot more carbohydrate in them and the carbohydrate to protein ratios are high. So if you have any in your family, you know, if you've got a diabetes issues in your family, I would say the wheats and probably even barley oats now are very different from what they used to be in that they have a lot more easily convertible calories that become sugars in your body. The other issue is how those crops are grown. Is anyone here from the prairies? So yeah, you know, there's a few hands. Um, it's no longer sections of um, of land, which is about 140 acres, we're talking thousands of acres for one farm. And they're all farmed primarily robotically. You know, the tractors are hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. In, when, in order to farm like that, you need your crop to mature all at the same time so you can set your machinery to go. And what allows <coughs> crops to mature all at once is Roundup. Glyphosate is sprayed as a pre-harvest desiccant so that everything is brown and then you, can then you can combine. And we can go into a little bit of glyphosate, what that is and what that can do, but primarily I th my, 
my opinion and those of a few that I've heard is that many of the health issues that we're now seeing in North America is because of the high concentration of Roundup or glyphosate in our diet. We are unknowingly consuming products which have a lot of this herbicide in it. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, wheat has been modified, but also the production system is totally different from what we used to do. So it's, it's due to the, the conversion of the food into sugar yeah. and carbohydrates. Yeah. That's the killer. Yeah. And uh, I understand that, that sugar um, in the forms that we talked about is, is bad. Yeah. That, and glyphosate is a, is a known antibiotic. You know, it kills bacteria. And we need our gut bacteria to survive. That's what allows us to digest and be healthy. And when you have a high concentration of antibiotic going into your gut, you know, I've never seen so many in this, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, all kinds of gut allergy issues to those types of foods. So I think a, a lot of this points towards glyphosate as the main cause. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad yeah. you mentioned, by the way, the uh, gut health, because yes. uh, a little plug for the fall, we're working on a talk around that very thing, sort of like new information about health and the um, um, microbiome. Yeah, yeah, so there we go. So we actually have uh, a, a professor emeritus that's going to lead us through that one in the fall. Um, this is my next hand. I wasn't going to raise this, but you mentioned it. There is a book called Gut. It's out. Yeah. I've just been reading a very good book. Uh, the reason that I raised my hand was you mentioned the decline in the production on the island. Mm -hmm. I wondered two things. One, what's the primary cause when you're bringing it? Number two, do you see any reversal to that happen? <sighs> primary cause of decline of agriculture on the island. I think there's no one primary cause. But I would say that as a farmer, you know, inputs coming onto the island are far more expensive than what they used to be. Um, they used to be actually subsidized by the Canadian government. Grains um, making it their way to the, the island were subsidized by the Canada Wheat Board. Fertilizers, all of the inputs that we need, there used to be a much stronger pipeline to get here. So those costs have gone up. Farmers are aging, and I don't see many farms with good succession plans of how they're going to pass their farms on down to their children. We have escalating farm land prices on the island. Um, we've seen it in the Comox Valley recently, where now properties you know, that were affordable are now over millions of dollars, um, and so that has that has prevented a new generation of farmers from coming onto the land. But I think, you know, a lot has to do with our purchasing practices. Where were we buying our fruits and vegetables in the 50s, 60s, 70s? Probably direct from our farm or through a farm market. And now where are we doing our majority of purchases? probably through a supermarket, which has its own supply chains, which requires farms to be quite large in order to supply them. You know, supermarkets don't like working with 100 farms. They want four or five to supply all of these products. They don't want to have to do with all these little ones. And Vancouver Island, just being the geography that it is, we have a lot of small, small farms. So where do I see it going? I do see a resurgence of interest in farming, especially in a new young generation of people um, who are doing all kinds of neat land sharing, crop sharing, cooperative farming, uh, urban farming. So I see hope there. Uh, but I think for, in order for it to really become mainstream, we all need to look at where we are purchasing the majority of our food from. Are you getting it from your farmer's market or your farmer themselves? Or do you really have no idea where this food comes from? Yeah. 
on a very small scale, I ran into a situation recently which probably would be worth relating here. By accident, I found out there was an individual who wanted to, to grow things in the backyard. He didn't have a backyard. I have a big backyard and I'm getting older. So the raised beds I used to have are diminishing and I'm planting lawn. Now that he's come along, I'm planting less lawn and he's growing his own, his own vegetables out of my raised beds. That's bed. fantastic. all that weed off me and I can continue to you know, the, you know the, the winds in that kind of situation are fantastic. I was farming in a similar method in Richmond. So, you know, if you can imagine land prices on the island, well, multiply that by a factor of 10, and that's what you get for farmland prices on the mainland. So I and a number of people were doing something similar, where we were farming people's front and backyards. So multiple sites where we had 500 square foot, 1,000 square foot, and we actually had one that was 2,000 square foot gardens, uh, farming it all, you know, planting everything, allowing the homeowner to take some vegetables, and then the rest we harvested and sold. The win for the landowner is that a, someone is by their place on a regular basis, and the majority of our landowners were older, someone was managing their garden because you know what happens when your garden kind of grows up and and isn't kept the not so nice folks in society realize that you might be not able to upkeep your place and you're a target for you know some not so nice things happening home invasions that kind of thing so having a you know a kept lawn activity on site keeps everybody safe and then you have that amazing interaction between the growers and the landowners we made fantastic friendships that way so it's a great idea well, yeah absolutely i there think there people. might be a group of people here who would be interested in that so yeah brilliant um uh, John? Uh, what are your thoughts about community neighborhood gardens Absolutely. So again, I'm going to put my Richmond hat on. When I was food security coordinator, uh, City of Richmond had a population of about 180,000 people. And when we first started, we had four community gardens. And by the time um, I finished in 2012, so that was five years, we had 13. I really th stress the importance of community gardens. As more and more people, um, as our urban centers are densifying, many of us don't even have access to gardens or to land. I mean, balcony garden is something that you can, everybody can do, but you know, for some types of crops, you really need land. And parks, public spaces, I think, should be made available to growers or people who want to grow food. It's just another way of showing others that food can be grown on a, and a lot of food can be grown on a very small plot of land. It's amazing what even a hundred square feet can grow. Um, so I'm very much in, in support of community gardens. Campbell River, I must say, is far ahead of the Comox Valley. How many, Peter, you said how many gardens Building there? Building our fourth right now, I think. Is that right, John? Fourth now? Actually five. Oh, five, sorry. Uh, uh, free plug, uh, Monday, August the 6th, BC Day, the Campbellton Neighborhood Community Garden is having its ah, farmer's market. That's market, fabulous. Where some of the growers will be selling produce, but this is the best thing. Uh, people in the neighborhood or anywhere in the city, if you got too many somethings, you can bring it along and sell it too. That's fabulous. That's the kind of thing that we need to see because I think for the longest time the paradigm in Canada was that you know rural and farm is over here and urban is over here and the two shall not meet. I don't think that creates a very healthy system, especially around food. I think the meshing of the two is really important for resiliency 
Uh, I would love to see more and more salad production grown within cities. You know, you've got these amazing rooftops oh, that, can, that can capture rainwater, right? Yeah. And, and we don't have that on a big farm. On, you know, not have to be big. We've got open space. But high water requiring crops like salad greens should be grown in the city. L leave the potatoes and squash and corn to us to grow. That is my, you know, in, in the future, what I see is a healthy uh, system where you've got the water intensive crops grown around the city, the land intensive crops grown in rural areas, and maybe some trading happening. So, yeah. But, yeah. So that was just how I was going to mention about rooftops. The rooftops. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and just a little bit more on community gardens. If, if some of you are in, uh, facilities like this or in uh, apartments or townhomes that you can't have a garden. They're really economical. I'm not sure about the other ones, but the one that I was involved in building, it's $35 per year and you get a six foot by about 30 foot garden plot in a raised bed and all the tools and everything are all there. You don't have to have your own tools. So for $35 and the cost of seed, you're in business. Yeah. So Courtney has one. And it's not really even officially a city of Courtney uh, community garden. It's run by a nonprofit group. Who, and the city begrudgingly gives them access to space. So Campbell River, if you've got five, you're far, far ahead. Four for sure and one coming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it. Who's next? Please. Um, in, in Duncan, they have the, the farmer's market on the south end of town, mm -hmm. and Russell on the north end. And, and they're selling vegetables uh, locally, I yep. believe, if they can't get them all year round. And they outsource them to go all winter. Is there anything like that in the works for this area, Com Comox Valley, Campbell River? As a short side. answer is no, not that I've heard. Um, you know, we do have uh, in both Campbell River and in the Comox Valley some very strong farmers markets. I was just at the Campbell River farmers market. It opened up on Sunday. Same with Courtney. I think one of the issues is now land and a building that can house something like um, a permanent site for a year-round market. Um, so I don't see a physical site like that coming up yet, but you know, the market in the Comox Valley runs 50 weeks of the year. So yeah, only- one day, one day a week. Though. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have a question. Um, I know, noticed one time we were down at the local uh, farmer's market and there was a lady there and she, they, they had a service where they will deliver one uh, camper full of vegetables to your door each week for a certain price. Sure, yeah. Well, that would sound like a good system. It would, yeah. So my own farm does something not, um, not direct to your door, but we have what's called a Community Supported Agriculture, CSA program, where you sign up in advance in the spring and then you get 16 weeks of vegetables. Um, you get a little bit of choice, but for the primary um, vegetables, it's pre-planned by the farmers that are putting the produce in. And then you get, you know, you get the first dibs. So um, we operate under a cooperative name called Merville Organics. And um, yeah, we get 16 weeks of, of not home delivery, but we do have a drop off in Campbell River at Fisherman's Wharf. Um, so that, and I do know of a few other farms that do that um, in the Comox Valley. I guess one of the issues around Campbell River is that you don't have many farms that are specific to, to Campbell River, right? I guess Sayward used to be a big farming area and farming community, but yeah. How much of the land of Vancouver Island is actually arable that would grow good crop. I don't have the statistics for all of Vancouver Island, but I do know for the Comox Valley, um, of the, um, the arable land that's in the ALR, only 20% of it is actively farmed. So we have a lot of acreage that is either just left fallow, um, maybe hayed once in a while, or not even hayed. Uh, and it's it, yeah, it's too. It's sad because that land is not in production its highest and best use. 
um, but we have plenty of room for growth is probably what I could say. And I think we could, with some um, modern, I don't have to say technology, so not GMOs, but just some more intensive production, uh, we could easily meet the demand for Vancouver Island here, at least on vegetables, here on the island. I'd like to chip in on that too, and then yeah. I'll come to you, John. Um, when I first moved to Campbell River, we were working on the Sustainable Community Plan. And I learned at that time that a lot more of Campbell River inside the city boundary than we know is in the Agricultural Land Reserve, mm -hmm. which I know is dear to your heart. Uh, but it's all tree. It's forested. Uh, and they've, they've checked the soil types. Yep. They're excellent. They're excellent. So, uh, and, and so we've got what could be farmland that's growing trees. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw yep. that in there, but please. Uh, not to my point exactly, yeah. but very, very close. Uh, the thing about the Peace River and the, the dam and, mm. oh, it's wonderful, arable land we're going to lose, and we've only got so little, is actually false. We have huge amounts of unused land, potentially arable. Right. I'm going to push back on that just because I know the soils in the Peace Valley w that are going to be flooded are class one and they're south facing. The microclimate is like the Fraser Valley. They can grow melons in the Peace River Delta. Because so sun. that and it's a south like the Peace River runs east west. And so you know that south facing face reflects light and holds heat and then the soils are alluvial. They're just fantastic. Um, so it is such a loss. Um, I know that's, that area is not in high production, but you know, we're all thinking long term, I think, uh, what's happening in the future. And we do not have much class one land. I mean, all of BC, only 5% is ALR. And of that 0.5 is class one, I mean, it's tiny. So losing class one, the best of the best, is very, very difficult to swallow. Especially in Richmond. Oh, don't, I don't, <laughs> so, yes. The ALR and Richmond, uh, having grown up there for 40 years, it's near and dear to my heart, but I, I use Richmond as the example of everything that could go wrong in community planning around agricultural land. Yeah. We'll leave it there. <laughs> Please. So I moved uh, to uh, so I tried to like have some uh, goals on my home, but I found that the soil is just really poor. Yeah. So I actually buy a trouble for three hundred dollars to put. Mm -hmm. so, so it's kind of like I want to do something, but it's cost, right? It's sure. Cost. Yeah. And then the second thing is because in my neighborhood have no one to grow food, so it's kind of like oh wow, well, why they don't grow? So it seems like I, I don't understand. So uh, can I ask one more thing is about urban chicken? Yeah. So do you feel that urban chicken would be uh, more uh, likely? <laughs> It's fantastic. I mean, Campbell River, areas of Campbell River allow urban chickens. My brother-in-law and his wife live sort of in Ocean Grove, and they're planting their chickens. They just moved there in, I think, in January. Uh, nowhere in the Comox Valley urban centers are you allowed chickens. Um, so you are the, another, another way ahead that you are. But uh, I do, you know, both raising of chickens Growing vegetables in the city, I think A, you're starting to get an appreciation for what farmers go through because yes, every year my fertilizer bill is about $2,000. My seed bill is about $1,500. And you know, for us as, an, as organic farmers, we are constantly looking at trying to build the soil. It's the life and that's where all the nutrients come from and that's where you really have to pay attention to. So, but if you're not starting with good soil, it takes time to build that up. Now, Northern Vancouver Island, you've actually got some resources that we don't have. You have a lot of fish compost facilities here. Um, and then up in Port McNeil, sea soil is there. 
we have to import all of that into the Comox Valley. Um, if you know of any farms that have excess manure, horse farms, you know, cattle farms, those are great sources of manure. And often if you haul it yourself, it's free. So, you know, you can look at some other um, ways of building your soil, but it can take time if the soil that you're starting with isn't the best. You also mentioned there's something too about your neighbors aren't growing anything and yeah. so it's not a cultural thing in your neighborhood and uh, I've noticed that too but I remember meeting this one fellow um, um, on Alder Street a major road in town and he's he was talking to me he said I, I want to grow vegetables in my front yard what do you think and I said do it and uh, and and if you actually check it he's just close to Rob Ron on Alder he's done an amazing job of building raised bed garden in his front yard yeah and uh, I, I hope he's a trendsetter. Yeah. <laughs> if you Google... It's covered with raised... Awesome. Raised bed, it's the only one in town where I've seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you Google food, not lawns, it's actually a whole movement of trying to encourage people. Because, you know, if you think about it, lawns are one of the more wasteful resource, resources that we have. You know, you're constantly... You're watering, fertilizing, and sometimes spraying in order to cut and throw it away. It makes no sense, right? What, what about though that you say like organic food is better, but like the one thing is a lot of organic food is not inspected. So saying organic is better is not always necessary. Mm. I'm gonna push back on that because being a certified organic farm, our farm is ex inspected every year and all certified but not, farms. But not all organic food is. And all that's organic why it's not always better. Right. All organic food in Canada is. I wouldn't I'm not I can't speak to the imported food. But under the Canadian organic regime, COR, and that's the logo that has the maple leaf, the organic maple leaf, all farms that use that plus the BC organic check mark, everyone is inspected every year. No way around that. Please. I, I wonder if you could comment on uh, the use of Grazon. Um, Grazon? Grazon, I'm not sure if you're aware that no. there's a chemical that, I think there's actually two chemicals in the product. Uh -huh. You can spray it on the field. The cows are allowed to go on it days afterwards. It goes into their, manu into their stomachs, doesn't affect them, comes out in their manure, and when you use your, that manure on your garden, yeah. It kills your plants. Ah. It's a big problem up north. So I haven't come across that particular chemical, but I have come across one called chlorpyrifos. And it's similar whereby, you know, it's sprayed on fields on hay. Um, it goes through the gut of animals or it actually stays in the hay. And if you use that hay as mulch, that it can transfer um, and pretty much kill. It's a um, it's a broadleaf herbicide, yeah. so basically all your vegetable crops, then the leaves curl up and, and die. I think that's yeah. one of the elements. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately with, you know, humans are amazing in that we figured out a way of using poisons to grow our food. And then we eat that food thinking that poison won't affect us. You know, we've totally disconnected ourselves from the fact that everything that we eat and they, whatever that animal or plant eats is, becomes every single cell of our bodies. So um, as you can imagine, you know, as an organic farmer, you know, we would be totally against that. Um, there has to be better ways. Like it seems up in the area where I'm from, that it's farmers' little dirty little secret that they use this stuff. Yeah. Nobody, you know. Acknowledges it. Yeah. You know, that's where you as consumers have a lot of power. Um, when I first moved to the Comox Valley, we started selling our eggs for $6 a dozen. And everybody else was three fifty four. So they were like, oh my God, how do you, why? So then people started asking questions. Well, our feed is non-GMO. It's certified organic. There are no pesticides. And they said, well, wait a minute. Isn't that how everybody does it? Well, no. And so suddenly, when you start asking, oh, the $4 egg 
grow. Do you use GMOs? And quite often, they didn't even realize. So the power of consumers, I can't stress enough how much asking, you know, it, what, is, what went into making this? Because as more growers and producers hear that this is something you need or are interested in, they will change their practices. But knowing that is the big thing. And it takes a lot of education. Yes. So who would have guessed that cow manure is not organic? So I'm here, <laughs> and then I'm back there. <coughs> I was reading an article some time ago, and um, Costco's terrible for organic and gluten-free of a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. Uh, oh, well, it's, it's not worth paying the price. Then I re read an article that when they say that they are orga organic, yeah. they're not regulated to the standard that Canada is. Mm -hmm. Each state, as I understand, there's no federal legislation. There is, yeah. Each state can say, you qualify as organic. Yeah. But they don't have to go through all the hoops and whistles right. that the Canadians have to go through. Um, I can't speak to, well, I can actually. Um, there is a federal organic system in, in the US, the, the NOP, National Organic Program. However, what is allowed in the US, some of that is not allowed in Canada. So there are some farms that use, for example, fracking water, uh, biosolids, um, which is totally not allowed in Canada. The issue is that Canada and US have a trade agreement in that we recognize each other's organic standards. It allows Canadian organic farmers to export into the U.S. and still have an organic symbol. And then similarly, U.S. product can come into Canada. I would stress, keep reading and keep asking. And yeah. Thank you. Uh, please. Yeah. Um, this is your, related to your question around amendments and yeah. things that are very nice. So you talk about using sea soil and composted salmon so that's from the fish farming industry. Um, I, my understanding is that sea soil is a hake. I don't think they use farmed fish up in that area. But so for certified organic farms, we aren't allowed to use any product that is from a, f a farmed fish. <coughs> so we actually, so I don't use sea soil on my property. It is a product that gardeners have access to. So, you know, I'm not going to hold everybody by the standards that we have to go through. No, but that's yeah. What I was yeah. Because when you mentioned that, it, it sounded like maybe you were and yeah. you always avoided the sea soil issue because it's coming from farm salmon. So yeah. the content of PCBs, and I can't think what else is in them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Doesn't it have to um, say that it's from um, farmed fish, like sea soil or something like yeah. that? Yeah, that's that's, right that's where I, th you know, I double check with sea soil. I have a feeling it's not farmed fish. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Day, but I yeah. Don't, I get some from the garden center, and I don't believe it is. Yeah. It could be worth asking yeah. because there's obviously a huge industry that has to deal with that transfer. Sure, right? sure, salmon. absolutely. I've seen a wall count over here and I you know, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of fish processing. Yeah, processing. right. But great question, yeah. You mentioned biosolids. Um, there's several communities that would like to sell, the communities themselves would like to sell biosolid uh, uh, mixed with compost and then sell it back to you for your garden. Um, but they're tested like crazy too, but they're tested for things like heavy metals and other things that you would typically find in yeah. waste treatment plant. You know what they're not tested for? <laughs> Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> because how many c can you test? I mean, I think about how, how many drugs that people are on. There's just no way of knowing um, what to test for, and it would just be far too expensive. So, you know, I, I think waste is absolutely something that we need to look at. Um, but, uh, you know, the mixing of waste and then not knowing what is going into that is a huge concern. Um, perhaps on forest land, you know, that's a way of regenerating some of the land that has been over forested and that there's no 
food production coming out of, but I would really be cautious about putting, um, bi everyone understands the, what biosolid means, okay? It's human, human manure, human waste that's been composted, hot composted. So there's no pathogens like E. coli or anything, but um, you know, there could be something else. So I don't recommend using that for food production. Please. Just sorry, just, just one more. I'm, I have a question for you in terms of some provinces, or one province that I know of from quite a while ago, mm -hmm. was actually developing a trust to purchase you know, in conjunction with farmers who were retiring, getting yeah. able to for purchase farmland and take it out of the whole commodities real estate mm -hmm. to preserve so that young farmers can lease yeah. long term and I think grow farms. Is there anything like that happening on Vancouver Island? Uh, not that I know of, no. So I believe that's Quebec. Quebec is, is very forward thinking on. Manitoba. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not something that the current government um, or previous governments have done. Um, I think a lot of that has um, been uh, pioneered by individuals who have come together and purchased land cooperatively and just purchased shares to ensure that that land stays farmland in perpetuity. But it requires people who are willing to put down money and then not get a return on it. Like it's just parked there to save this piece of property. So it takes. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So there is a new food land trust, BC Food Land Trust, that has just started. I think their first property, though, is in the Okanagan. Yeah. Thank you. Here's my next hand. Yes. You might have just answered it. What do you see as the biggest barrier mm -hmm. to young people starting a farming mm -hmm. operation like you have? And what do you think is, or what do you see as the most positive help or things that um, help a person start a farm? Yeah. Um, I don't think there's one specific thing for new farmers. There's three. So access to land. So phys you know, physically finding either that front or backyard or a piece of someone else's property to lease. So finding that land. Access to capital. So not many young people have um, good credit scores um, or ha are able to bring with them a lot of you know, financial backing, unless their families are also joining them in, in supporting them. So, and many banks, you know, you only get access to credit based on what you can put down as collateral. So what does a young person put down as collateral? I mean, not, very few people are even owning their own cars these days, right? So no money, and farming takes a lot of cash to start up between 10 and 20,000, I would say, per acre to start into production. So it's a lot. What is number three? Number three is access to knowledge. So uh, who I see becoming farmers right now are young people who don't come from farming families. And I don't know if that's the naivety of like the bucolic farm life. I don't think so. I think there are many of them are coming into this eyes wide open, but they don't have that long history of what, um, of the soil, of the land, the climate, what grows well here, how do I sell this, who in the community has a tractor, where do I get you know, advice from. There's uh, this long list of, of knowledge that older farmers keep with them, right, that they've built up over time that is not being passed down to the young people who need it. So three things. So where I see um, some progress around this, there is an organization called the Young Agrarians that started in British Columbia, is now spreading to um, Alberta, Ontario. And you know, it's basically young people coming together and together figuring some of this information out, helping each other with the knowledge, the techniques, the systems, uh, helping each other, sharing 
lease templates that someone used on this farm and it worked well, so they're now sharing it along and using that as a way of discussions with landowners. And then, uh, you know, coming together, looking at Farm Credit Canada and Van City. Van City is one credit union that is actually providing uh, loans to new farmers. So because of some of the pressure that Young Agrarians has put on them, they have now opened up um, an up to $75,000 loan for someone starting a farm, which is great. Yeah. That wouldn't be a dairy farm. No, no. And because yeah. By the time you buy a quota. Quota, I mean, you're talking millions. Yes. No, we're primarily talking vegetables, um, some beef, some sheep. I mean, the smaller animals, um, but definitely not dairy. You know, the thing is, though, dairy we're, is not in trouble. Supply management, so dairy, eggs, the quota, um, quota uh, products are, are not hurting. Those farms are doing well. They're multi-million dollar farms, but um, they've got their supply and everything regulated. Every, everything seems to be doing quite well. It's the other side that we have to, to look at. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Arzini, you mentioned climate. Yes. How big of a role is the change in climate in your farming Oh my gosh. <laughs> climate, how do I even come close to this? So I'll answer it like this. I've been in the Comox Valley six years. I have never had a season that's been similar to the previous one total unpredictability. I could have never imagined that this year, March, April, would have been as dry as it had. Because you know, last year, the farm was underwater at this time of the year. We were flooded. We couldn't plant anything. Everything was late. We were freaking out. 2015, we had all that snow. Like, who could have imagined you know, all of the weird things that are coming out? So climate for us, it's not that things are only getting hotter. I mean, you know, temperatures are going up, obviously. But it's the unpredictability. I, I, I just don't know where things are coming at us. So we have new pests. I don't know if you heard on Vancouver Island, this uh, army worm flew in from Texas the butterfly or the moth got, flew in on some giant windstorm and it impacted you know, a number of Port Alberni, Comox Valley hay fields. We have a new pest for us this year, crane fly larva. We've never had an issue, this is like leather jackets. The larva, I don't know if it's been the cold soil, dry, uh, but they took out our, all of our early plantings so it's been very, very tough. I should mention, myself and my husband, we both have master's degrees in agriculture, plus we have a friend who is a PhD in agriculture. So seven degrees working on our farm, and we still pull our hair out. It, it's so uh, difficult sometimes to really get a grasp on what the climate insects, pests, diseases, all the things that are being thrown at us. So I can just imagine people who don't have that background in egg, it must be so difficult for them to even figure out, at least for us, we can diagnose. But most farms, I think, don't even, couldn't even figure out what the problem is in the first place. No. In other words, welcome to farming. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. But there's always next year. Yeah, there's always next year. Uh, Somebody else? Uh, Maybe you can talk about palm oil, like just like, mm. oil farming and how devastating that is. Absolutely. So uh, in my previous life, prior to starting my own farm, uh, I worked in overseas in uh, community development, international development, primarily in Thailand. Um, so for those of you who don't know, palm oil uh, is the seed of a palm tree. Uh, it's grown primarily in Southeast Asia, but uh, the, the method that is used to grow it requires deforestation of the land that's there. And um, it's a very intensive 
production system that removes like high pesticide chemical use impacts the flora and fauna like nothing else in Southeast Asia. And then uh, these plantations are primarily owned by large scale companies, international um, companies. So the, the money doesn't stay in the community. It's often going off elsewhere. So for those of, I mean, some of you may have heard of the impact it's happening on orangutan species in Indonesia, Borneo area. I mean, whole forests being burned down so that these plantations can be put up. If you don't think that you're eating palm oil, if any of you have eaten Nutella, that's palm oil. It's a very stable, shelf-stable oil, and that's why it's used. So I was super glad to see on Sunday at the farmer's market, a young farming couple had started selling a nut butter, a chocolate nut butter, because my kids, you know, I'm the, the bad mom, the really mean mom, because I know all this information. I don't allow Nutella uh, in the house, but we saw this nut butter that was just made with <coughs> peanuts, cocoa, you know, just no palm oil. So yay, they got like a, an alternative. But really read your packages. So palm oil isn't a GMO crop, but it is a very intensive crop that has a lot of impact on land in, on a planetary basis. So and thanks for coming. Like soap, uh, shampoo, yeah. Thank you for bringing that yeah. up. Uh, we're almost out of time, folks, so if we're holding on to one, this is your chance. That was fast. This always goes so fast. Well, not seeing a hand, okay. you've actually reminded me of something you told us in Comox last week about the inadvertent effects of food aid to other can countries. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, through my experience working overseas, so I've worked in Thailand, India, Bangladesh, uh, my family is originally from East Africa, so I have some either first-hand knowledge or through family connections of basically what's happening on a global scale. Uh, you know, as North Americans, and I think a lot of North American farmers, we feel the need to feed the world, and really that mindset has some very catastrophic impacts on farmers in developing countries because we can actually produce grains, pulses, at far cheaper costs than what many third world farmers can. So I don't know if many of you know that Canada now is one of the top exporters of lentils in the world. And we are now selling lentils to India. And our lentils, because of the thousands of acreages of acres that can be under production, harvested by machines, cleaned by machines, and then shipped off um, in these um, you know, amazing scales, we are now putting third world farmers out of production. They can't compete with the prices that Canadian farmers can sell their product at. So we really need to think about what our dumping of product on the world markets has, the impact it has. I have full confidence that third world farmers, if given an, a, an even playing field, where they don't have to compete with product that's dumped here, could easily feed their own countries. You know, if they didn't have to compete with our product, and if our consumption rates didn't out pace them or outplace them. You know, your burgers and North American meat production relies on Amazon forests being cut down so that soybeans can be grown, right? So our food consumption systems and the way that our farms produce is having a global impact. So another reason to maybe be a bit more mindful of what we're putting in our mouths. Thank you. That's a lovely place to stop. Oh, under, under the wire. Okay. <laughs> Even worse than the, uh, the lower prices because of production here. Yes. Is the way in which subsidized European and American grains yes. are given to African countries. And the African countries 
the farmers can't compete with no. zero cost. Absolutely. The country. And then there's no incentive so to, they yeah. Become, they become yeah. hooked on the stuff. Absolutely, and yeah. People wonder why you know, Africa is not developing in the way it is. Yeah. It seems like a good thing to do. Let's give these poor, starving people great. You know, you're creating more starving people by doing Yeah. How about instead of that, we purchase grain from the region so that it's fed to people who don't have enough food? Yeah. Let's keep our Love feed it. ourselves and then, yeah. Uh, thank you. So um, we've gone just past eight. Um, I'm going to give you a moment to think about how to wrap up. But I just want to thank you all once again for coming out. I hope we'll see you a month. We're always here on the second Wednesday of the month here, uh, but not in July and August. Uh, but we will be back to talk about sustainability next month. Uh, the uh, Comox Valley uh, Global Awareness Group uh, will be here to talk about, I believe what they want to specifically speak about is whether or not the environmental uh, goals of the United Nations are even possible or whether there's already so much damage to some ecosystems that, that there's nothing could be done. So that, doesn't, that sounds like quite a downer, so hopefully they'll <laughs> also bring something more positive. Uh, but then as we're working on quite a lineup starting again in September. Um, but if you didn't receive an email from me about the notification of these and you would like one, there is a, a, a sheet there you can put your name on. Uh, you, we don't take attendance, but if you want to hear from me you know, a few days in advance of each one of these, put your name down. Um, please. Sure. So, you know, I'm so grateful to have been here today and hear the questions and comments and ideas. Um, I think we covered such a broad range of topics, but what I got from it was that many of you are knowledgeable about some of the issues that are happening globally with things like palm oil, GMOs, um, dumping of food um, internationally. And, you know, it can be quite a depressing sometimes seen, but I think where we have hope and where we um, can move forward is really in our own backyards. Um, we heard some fantastic stories about food being grown in front and backyards here in Campbell River. And you know, I, don't mistake what a huge impact that can have on not just you yourself, your physical health, um, but how your neighbors perceive that land use. And then the more land we can get into production here on the North Island, I think it just, for everybody's food security, it's a huge benefit. So I hope you go away with a little bit, at least some positive ideas and things that you can do. And I look forward to, if you're ever in the Comox Valley, come stop by the farmer's market. I'm there almost every Saturday and would love to chat with you some more. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope we see you again.